Hi, everyone. I'm Jay Wong, Director of the USC Center on Public Diplomacy. I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Cultural Diplomacy in Your Neighborhood. Uh, this program is in partnership with the North American Cultural Diplomacy Initiative to examine cultural relations at the local level. It is also part of CPD's project on re-examining, reimagining Korean town city diplomacy in action, supported by the Korean Foundation, to explore Korean town and its cultural significance through the lens of city diplomacy. The North American Cultural Diplomacy Initiative is a multidisciplinary research network of academics, policymakers, and practitioners in the field of cultural diplomacy from North America and beyond, led by our colleagues at Queen's University and several other institutions. I wanted to begin by acknowledging that this university occupies the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of Gabrielino Tova Kish people. We honor their role in caring for the land and recognize the history of conquest which they have endured. I also recognize the ongoing struggles of this community and all this region's indigenous people for recognition and justice. This is the last session of the North American Cultural Diplomacy Initiative Summit on Players We Are All Practitioners, the second in a series of three summits on cultural relations approach to diplomacy. This session puts the focus and puts forth the city and its constituent actors as players in their own right in global cultural relations. We'll delve into the diverse ways that local spaces and communities are actively engaged in cultural diplomacy in North America. We'll attend to actors from the municipal landscape, from representatives of city governments to representatives of urban neighborhoods, cultural districts, and businesses and nonprofits. The aim of our discussion is to extend conversations to the diverse players that constitute the city, those who are not only involved, but in many cases, driving new networks and relationships with global implications. So to help us consider the nuance of the local, the types of spaces, organizations, and communities that facilitate city diplomacy today, we have an excellent panel of speakers with us. Let me briefly introduce them. Uh, first is Wunter Brendemuel, International Arts Programmer at the Goethe Institute, Toronto. Edward T. Chen, Professor of Ethnic Studies and Founding Director of the Young O Kim Center for Korean American Studies at the University of California, Riverside. And Sherry Dalashihi, Chief Diploma Diplomacy and Protocol Officer of the City of San Antonio. And Heather Kelly, founder of the Law Street Cultural Corridor in Toronto. So the program will start with remarks by each panelist. I'll then moderate a discussion with them and before turning to questions from our audience. I'd like to first invite Heather Kelly of Toronto's Law Street Cultural Corridor to give remarks. Heather? There we go. Okay, I think you can hear me now? Yes. yes. Excellent. Hello, everybody. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that where I'm speaking from and the neighborhood and city I'll be speaking about today is on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. And with that, hello. As Jay said, my name is Heather Kelly, and I am not a diplomat or a scholar, nor an expert in cultural diplomacy. I am an arts and culture marketing professional, and I've worked for many, many years to create meaningful connection between a diverse range of peoples and organizations. And I'm the founder of a significant partnership network of arts and culture organizations that are all located within one mile or just over one kilometer in downtown Toronto. And it's called the Bloor Street Culture Corridor. So that's a consortium of 22 arts and culture organizations, large and small in the neighborhood. And together they make it Toronto's most diverse arts and culture district. So I'd like to take about 50 seconds um, to name the partners for you, both as acknowledgement for them and of them, and so that you have a taste of the variety of players and cultural organizations in the neighborhood. 
So the corridor partners include Alliance Francaise de Toronto, the Badachou Museum, a different book list cultural center, Gardner Museum, Hot Docs Ted Rogers Cinema, the Istituto Italiano di Cultura, the Japan Foundation, the Miles Nadal Jewish Community Center, the Museum of Estonians Abroad, the Music Gallery, the Native Canadian Center of Toronto, the Randolph Center for the Arts, the Royal Conservatory of Music, the Royal Ontario Museum, Sound Streams, Taffel Music, the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library, the Toronto Consort, the Toronto Reference Library, the University of Toronto Faculty of Music, the Women's Art Association of Canada, and 918 Bathurst Centre for Culture, Arts, Media and Education. So a neighbourhood is an ecosystem. I like to think of it as a mixture of culture and commerce and community. The Bloor Street Culture Corridor spans two really well-known Toronto neighbourhoods, the Annex and the York and Yorkville area. And really the culture actually just of those two neighbourhoods are quite distinct. Alongside the cultural organisations, of course, there's retailers and restaurants, cafes and bars, office towers, heritage homes, condos and university dorms. There are also significant players in the neighbourhood and that include the residence associations, the local business improvement area organizations, the developers, the faith places, the local city councillors and other elected officials, and the University of Toronto. So a lot of players in a small geographic area. Now, neighborhood level cultural relations really are essential in a diversely multicultural city like Toronto. Toronto has been recognized by both the United Nations and the BBC as the most diverse city in the world. 51% of our residents were not born in Canada. This is higher than any other metro region in North America and many European cities as well. So there's over 250 ethnicities and 170 languages in the Toronto region and roughly half the population identifies as a visible minority. So not only is connection and respect a baseline for understanding and appreciation and caring for each other as community members, it's also been shown that these people, our friends and colleagues and neighbours, also act as ambassadors for their local neighbourhoods and the culture of their chosen home city, in Toronto in this case, both when they travel and when they have visitors come to the city. So in addition to individuals, when we look at the arts and culture organizations, pre-COVID, um, there were many ways that our arts and culture organizations had been engaging in what we might call international cultural relations. A few specific examples include things like bringing performers, films and artists from all over the globe and presenting them here in our city creating performance productions, exhibitions, and even ensembles that are presented in other cities and countries around the world, bringing in delegations of culture professionals from all over the world for symposia, conferences, or to experience some of the performances and exhibitions that have been created here, participating in official political cultural delegations in other countries, participating and often being the ones to animate local events and festivals, knowledge sharing and collaborating with peer organizations and peer professionals all around the world, international tourism marketing, and there's many, many other ways too. Complementing the cultural organization's work as a neighborhood-based culture district, some of the boots on the ground things that we do are providing a forum for partnership and collaboration and knowledge sharing among the cultural organizations in the neighborhood and beyond. We share our story and our structure with other cities interested in forming a similar partnership network, um, as well as other parts of Toronto. We give presentations at symposia and speak about the positive power of partnership for other networks and cultural organizations. We participate in international delegations where we formed relationships and shared knowledge. Um, we host, num or have hosted at least, to numerous tours of international journalists along the corridor. 
Um, we engage in dialogue with networks of arts organizations and, and arts organizations as individuals and as networks in other countries. And we also um, interact on the local level with local residents association meetings, community liaison committee meetings, things like that. Um, we've initiated collaboration and conversations, and we also participate in just informal monthly relationship building meetups of culture sector professionals and cultural attaches from local consulates and embassies. So honestly, there's so much more that could be done if the corridor had funding and paid staff, but we don't. Pre-COVID, more than three million members of the public went to the Bloor Street Culture Corridor for arts and culture, their destinations, the exhibitions, performances, films, and events. There's more than 250 to 350 events every month before COVID happened um, on the corridor. But the, but the change now is that during the last year and a half, of course, most cultural organizations and local destinations were forced to close. So many arts organizations turn to presenting online and connecting with both global audiences and local communities digitally. We've here in Toronto, we've been able to open at full capacity for about two months now. So we're really at the beginning stages of rebuilding our organizations, renewing our relationships, reconfiguring, reconnecting, and I hope revitalizing the neighborhood. I believe that neighborhood cultural diplomacy is culture-centered relationships within the neighborhood, as well as the neighborhood's relationship with the rest of the city, as well as the individual and collective international endeavors and relationships that are stewarded. So really there's almost nothing, right, that we know that, we know that there's almost nothing that thrives in isolation. The exchange of information, ideas, and inspiration, as well as collaboration and working together for larger purposes, is so important to developing and understanding and influencing, and also to creating spaces, programming, and relationships that have meaning and value, and to fostering vibrant neighborhoods that can have global impact. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I uh, I was told to give a presentation on Koreatown in Southern California, and as many of you know, the, in Los Angeles we have a largest concentration of Korean immigrants anywhere in the world, and it began around 1970s. And it's a Koreatown, LA, is a heart and soul and capital of Korean American community. Yeah, it serves as an anchor and hub of a transnational enclaves. During the 70s and 80s, uh, Koreatown LA served as a traditional ethnic enclave, many serving immigrants arriving from Korea, uh, helped them adjust and make an American dream come true. However, today it served as a major focal point of a transnational enclave and recognized as one of the most visible, largest concentration of Korean immigrant community. So what I would like to do, roughly Koreatown is recognized in LA, uh, to the west is uh, the Vermont Avenue, to the east, uh, Wilton or Western Avenue, to the north, uh, Third or, or, or Melrose Avenue, or to the south, uh, probably Pico uh, Bluebird. Uh, that's the you know quite large area, uh, unlike uh, Chinatown or Little Tokyo, which is very concentrated. Compared to Chinatown and Little Tokyo, Koreatown in LA is uh, quite large. Not not only that, we have what is known as a suburban Koreatown popping up. Uh, in places like Irvine, uh, Fullerton, Buena Park, Torrance, San Fernando Valley, or Diamond Bar. So we have uh, not only a concentration of Korean immigrants in the city of Los Angeles, but also they moved on to suburban communities for you know, you know education and the search of better uh, opportunities. And 
So what I would like to do is I would like to provide some historical context of how evolution of a queer town in Los Angeles. Of course, it serves very important economic, political, cultural, and, and, and educational functions. It's a focal point of a Korean American community. Uh, until 2015, uh, I did not know anything about uh, the Riverside Koreatown, which all began uh, Koreatown. We knew Koreatown existed in Los Angeles, in New York City, or places like Osaka, Japan, or in, in China, or different places. But here in North America, in, in the United States, nobody knew anything about the existence of, of the first Korea town, the Pachapa camp. Uh, the Pachapa camp was located here in Riverside, where I've been teaching for the last 30 years. And yet, I did not know anything about it. Nobody knew anything about it. And recently, uh, we began an exhibition here in downtown Riverside, and uh, many media uh, became very interested in the story. New York Times, LA Times, NBC News, PBS News Hour, and NPR, they all covered the story of this fascinating story. It all began with the uh, you know, discovery of a small map produced by the Sanborn Insurance Company of New York in 1908. It shows the downtown Riverside, and it says Korean settlement. And of course, nobody knew anything about it beyond the, the small map that it was discovered by the undergrad students at UCR in early 2000. And then I began research project and I found that it was the first Korean settlement in the United States led by very famous uh, leader of uh, Dosan An Chang Ho, who dedicated the entire life for independence of Korea, which is, you know, the Pachapa camp served as not only uh, focal point, early uh, focal point of independence movement. Later on, it set the foundation of a modern democratic republicanism of Shanghai, in Shanghai Korean provisional government in 1919, and later on, 1948, Republic of Korea. So it, it, it served very important historical origins. In 1913, An Chang'e relocated to downtown Los Angeles, uh, Bunker Hill. In around 1940s, Korean immigrants began forming uh, their own community near USC, where Jefferson Boulevard. In 1965, the Immigration Act allowed Korean immigrants to immigrate to the United States in large numbers. That's when they began to settle in along Olympic Boulevard. I remember uh, catering the Olympic market uh, and VIP Plaza. Uh, that's where it all began in the 70s. And, and yet nobody really knew anything about Korean American community. Uh, although the Korean American community, Korean settlement in Koreatown was expanding rapidly during the 70s and 80s until LA civil unrest of 1992. All of a sudden, uh, Angelinos found out there is a Korean immigrant settlement in Koreatown, and we became very visible. Until 1992, Korean Americans were invisible. No one really knew anything about it, and no one really cared. But everything changed, and that's when Korean America was born and reborn, and Korean American identity was born. And uh, Koreatown became a very focal point of city politics, economy, and cultural and hub. And since then, the Korean American community and Koreatown uh, has expanded from traditional ethnic enclave serving primarily Korean immigrants to more and more transnational enclave that all kinds of different ethnic generational background are catering and coming to Koreatown, not only to enjoy Korean barbecue, uh, but also K-pop, uh, as well as cultural diplomacy, where all the you know important uh, visitors from Korea uh, would come to K K Koreatown 
and mid Korean immigrants. And so homeland politics also plays a major, major role today. And so it, it is, uh, you know, Koreatown today not only serves the traditional ethnic enclave, uh, a focal point of educational, economic, cultural hub of Korean immigrants, but also it's a very dynamic, growing uh, meeting place uh, for all kinds of different people, not only, uh, you know, majority of the region of Koreatown is Latino, and uh, it's a, it serves also Hollywood. Therefore, a lot of people in the media or, or movie industry come down to Koreatown. And the K-pop, you know, recently Minari, uh, which critically examined the life of Korean immigrants, as well as uh, uh, Parasite uh, last year won Academy Award. Because of that, the Koreatown has become truly a very dynamic uh, emerging place where all kinds of different people come and enjoy and mingle and engage in uh, diplomacy, personal diplomacy. Thank you so much. Good morning and good morning everyone. My name is Sherry Dolachahi and uh, I have the privilege to work for the city at the municipality of San Antonio, Texas as the chief uh, diplomacy and protocol officer. I head up our uh, international relations around the world for our local city government. And one of the important pillars of our work is cultural diplomacy. Um, I, I think I'd like to start by saying that San Antonio is the largest Hispanic majority city in the United States. It's 64% of our population is Hispanic. And that's very important in terms of the identity and the heritage that we celebrate in our community. Uh, the San Antonio is home to the first Mexican cultural institute of the Mexican government outside Mexico, uh, which was set up here in 1968. There are now numerous Mexican cultural institutes around the United States and other countries of the world, but we were home to their very first cultural institute. And that is important for us to mention because of those familial and cultural links with Mexico. We were also home to the first extension of foreign extension of a Mexican university, the National Autonomous University of Mexico, the UNAM, known in Mexico, in the United States and the world uh, here in San Antonio. Again, uh, that relationship started at the right at the end of World War II in 1944. They established a presence here, very much focused on uh, 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 keeping uh, a lot of our local newcomers from Mexico who had come after the Mexican Revolution. Uh, connected to their culture, to the language, and then, of course, became an institution that was sharing Mexican culture and language with the local community through our education institutions. So those two organizations really set a stage, uh, again, for why San Antonio has this very special relationship with Mexico, and then, of course, tying it back to our uh, uh, majority Hispanic city. Uh, recently, the state of Texas designated in downtown San Antonio, uh, what we call a zona cultural, it's a kind of a neighborhood. It has this official designation, uh, uh, which has is now allowing for private and partner, private and public investment in an area to celebrate again this very rich. Uh, heritage. And uh, also, uh, we saw uh, right before the pandemic in 2019, we celebrated, uh, I think we had our largest celebrations of many Day of the Dead uh, festivities, which are very closely linked with Mexican culture. Our, our community has celebrated Day of the Dead for for forever. Uh, and there's always been some monumental celebrations in our downtown area. And in 2019, there was an additional festival added. And, and recently, after the pandemic this year, we, we saw a lot of that um, come back into our downtown. We also celebrate the Mexican independence. And again, it connects with all the people in uh, across San Antonio who self-identify with Mexico, with the Mexican heritage. Now, 
all of that, having said all of that, of course, uh, means that we've also kept very, very good relationships with the Mexican government through the Mexican consulate here. And, and when we talk about cultural diplomacy, I think definitely there is undoubtedly culture speaks to all of us, um, and especially in the field of the visual and performing arts. It's a language that everyone understands. It's a universal language. And we, in our office, uh, when we're talking about international relations, the promoting international relations, we have found that the cultural activities and relationships are very often the easiest to promote and foster, um, uh, especially with the official relationships that we celebrate around the world. But bringing it back to San Antonio, we've obviously uh, in for many decades now have seen immigration from other parts of the world. And so increasingly, there are other diaspora groups, other communities that have made San Antonio their home and they are represented, they're part of our community. And so um, we have made it part of our work uh, in our office to connect with our diaspora groups uh, in San Antonio, to get to know them and to know what is happening within specific groups. I would say that our largest um, in the immigrant community, the largest growing group is our Asian minorities. And as part of, for instance, a celebration of Asian culture, there's there again, many groups, many diaspora groups have their um, celebrations uh, uh, and uh, very often they involve uh, the city organization. Uh, at the very least, they work with our Department of Arts and Culture, which is actually um, a department that has you know, historically provided, you know, very generous funding to numerous arts organizations in San Antonio and increasingly trying to reach out to some of these smaller groups to allow them to be represented uh, as part of this cultural fabric and also to, to really kind of um, be inclusive uh, of this diversity. And um, I, I, you know, something that I feel very, very proud of uh, in our office, we work with, uh, we oversee our sister city and friendship cities around the world. And so that's part of our portfolio. And that of course means that the work that we do in cultural diplomacy is one of the pillars of the activities that we carry out with our sister and friendship cities. Um, and so when we uh, celebrated our relationship with Chennai in India, and we have where we have a sister city, uh, we created a festival uh, where we hold uh, the city sponsors and a Diwali, the annual Diwali Festival of Lights in downtown San Antonio. And that Diwali over 13 years has grown into a, a huge cultural arts festival, which attracts, uh, of course, our local community, not just the Indian community, but our community at large. It it's about sharing the Indian culture within our community. Importantly, it has the support of our local government. It's obviously give, they receive funding from the private sector and from local groups, but that support of our local municipal government in making sure that they have a successful event, you know, has been very crucial to having this event uh, become one of the largest um, publicly supported Diwalis uh, in the country. Uh, so uh, before the pandemic, we drew 40,000 people into uh, the park where it was celebrated. Our Japanese community through the Japanese American Society have an, a festival every year, which is the Akimatsui Ball Festival in our local botanical garden. Uh, in the past, we've had a folk life festival celebrating all of the ethnicities of Texas in San Antonio, a specific Asian festival. Both of those festivals carried out through our local University of Texas in San Antonio. Of course, San Antonio has is home to Fiesta San Antonio a 10-day celebration in April every year, which again has its roots back in our uh, history of our community, but today very well-known um, festival that kind of again highlights uh, the many diverse communities we have in our city. Um, now, 
as part of our work in the international office, we also have to uh, very often work reciprocally with other uh, cities in our in our partnership portfolio. And so that has meant that there have been exchanges of gifts, public art gifts, and we've received, we've been the beneficiary of a beautiful um, Korean pavilion, a uh, fantastic Japanese garden in our botanical garden, a fantastic Mexican, authentic Mexican gazebo from the state of Jalisco in our downtown area. So there are these wonderful symbols uh, across San Antonio that are representative of these important friendships that we have built around the world. So again, we always have to remind our authorities about reciprocity and what do we give in return and find ways to reciprocate these gifts and, and also take our culture and op provide opportunities for some of our local artists to be able to be seen uh, abroad. And so there is always that interweaving and cross-section of the work that we're doing with with our Department of Arts and Culture, as well as other city departments. I, I always say that our office is a connector. We work with city departments to make sure that these relationships are working, uh, but that we are also having that impact. And so in terms of our cultural, the work in, in the space of cultural diplomacy, uh, we're involved with our arts and culture department, our parks and recreation department, the library system, the our World Heritage Office, which oversees, uh, which is involved with two of our UNESCO designations. And I will say that, you know, when we received the World Heritage Site designation, for our historic San Antonio missions in 2015 uh, from the UNESCO. And in 2017, we, we, we were inducted into the UNESCO Creative Cities Network. Uh, both of those uh, international, very important, uh, highly visible designations have really been uh, so pivotal to, again, the work that we do. Uh, so I um, could talk forever. Uh, there's so many examples that I can give of uh, a cultural diplomacy through the work uh, in the international uh, space, but I'll, I'll wait and reserve uh, more comments for questions later on. Uh, to finish up, I feel that the role of education, higher education, youth organizations is equally important as the arts and culture organizations in our community. And so creating and, cre uh, and maintaining very close working relationships with those organizations helps us not only work within our neighborhoods, but also to bring the world from the outside into our neighborhoods and take our neighborhoods out into the world. Thank you very much. Aha, here we go. There was one too many uh, fields open. Hello, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jutta Brendemüll. I'm an international arts programmer. That means I curate residency exchanges, um, exhibitions, media installations. I run a contemporary German uh, film series here in Toronto. Um, I commission video essays, short films. And in that role, um, I often have the privilege of working with luminaries, uh, such as, say, Wim Wenders uh, from Berlin or Robert Rauschenberg. I don't often get asked to talk about the importance of neighborhood engagement in ICR, international cultural relations. And I think it is a really undervalued area of exploration and opportunity in a wider global context. And I'm all the happier to be part of this conversation today. So thank you to everyone at the North American Cultural Diplomacy, Diplomacy Initiative, uh, as well as Jay and his fantastic team at uh, USC. I'm also an immigrated citizen of Toronto. And uh, I do get the question, why did you leave uh, Berlin for Toronto? One of the answers truly is neighborhoods. Not that Berlin uh, doesn't have neighborhoods and is not neighborhood based, but they're larger districts and they're, they don't quite have uh, the quality that uh, Toronto has. So much of what you will hear from me today comes out of 20 plus years of practical ICR experience, but also my lived experience and decisions about what is important to me and my family um, in where and how we live. And uh, of course, um, we recognize that this is indigenous land. 
um, and I'm trying to um, take the stewardship um, serious in terms of integrating indigenous uh, perspectives and wisdoms into my programming and the work that I do. Um, I just wanted to kick us off with about 10 or so uh, image and text impulses, which I will share in one second. If Valeria, if you can prompt me again, I had to unclick that option. Um, I won't read through it, but walk us through it um, as soon as I can share my screen. Okay, there we go. Um, so there's me again uh, with Frankfurt artist Justus Becker. As part of a City of Frankfurt and City of Toronto, Sister City, graffiti exchange that I facilitated for the Goethe Institute, the German cultural center that I work for. And uh, Justus finished this image, um, and it's it's huge, uh, uh, leaving a Frankfurt sort of thumbprint. You can see that in the background, and I love it because it really leaves a trace and an identity along Toronto's Bloor Cultural Corridor, which my good friend and, and amazing colleague Heather Kelly uh, has already introduced us to. Um, let me get down to my first slide. So really what the neighborhood is, it's, it's there, you know, that's why I called it ready. If you step out of yourself and your, your apartment or your house, uh, and your family context, then you're in the neighborhood, even before you enter specific communities. Um, so it's really wide open at that point. Whether the potential is realized is a whole different question. Um, and luckily enough, as I was putting this together, uh, I received the Toronto Arts Foundation newsletter, which had a neighborhood arts network uh, sort of year in review. Uh, with a lot of keywords that I'm not going to go through, but I'm just going to sort of trigger them and point them out. So on this little screen here, we see excellence, we see learning, we see mentorship and training, collaboration, and the mention of artists uh, and youth. And of course, these are all important aspects of neighborhood engagement. Uh, I mentioned the openness uh, factor and the potential, whether this is realized and how we can realize this, we can discuss. On this slide, what was most important to me is the interpersonal encounter. And with that, I think every cultural experience um, uh, and learning starts. Anybody who's ever done a, uh, a school exchange, say, and if you're lucky, uh, and I am as a European, I did one when I was 17 in outside of Minnesota, uh, uh, Minneapolis in Minnesota. And that has shaped uh, the rest of my life and my relationship to North America very much. So it starts at the personal level. Um, I should have maybe called this, uh, now that I'm looking at it uh, yesterday, I should have maybe called it activated, not just active. Neighborhoods need to be activated. Um, and here I'm going a step further and I'm mentioning the inter-community exchange. And I hope we can get to questions around what makes um, uh, neighborhoods uh, may be different from communities uh, in definition and an opportunity. I will just point out uh, this photo is such bad quality because I took a screenshot yesterday or a shot, I should say, um, of a, an old photo of, on my fridge. On the left, this is my husband who is um, uh, an arts professor uh, now but used to do a lot of uh, creative workshops. He's a musician and composer. And this image could not be more Toronto. You see four people, uh, all of them from different uh, ethnicities, all of them new Canadians uh, of, of uh, uh, different age groups, um, and they do work together. And this is uh, a neighborhood initiative that my husband Deb was a part of. Um, enough with the coziness. Uh, neighborhoods have an amazing potential to be the ground zero for critical engagement. Um, and that's probably me as a sort of Berliner and, and European speaking a bit too. I was looking for a rights-free photo I didn't find of um, Artist House Betanien. Betanien is probably the best known uh, squatted, I'm not gonna say illegally squatted, um, squatted house in Berlin in the 80s in West Berlin and in the reunited uh, city. It was taken over by the city. Um, and is run as an art center. It is one of the amazing success stories of neighborhood action, 
leave, leading to sort of policy changes um, and to direct action. Uh, for example, the Canadian government, the Canadian embassy in Berlin runs an artist residency out of this formerly squatted building. I swapped in uh, another image here that is from Stuttgart in Germany, but never mind. Interestingly, this image here has the slogan, the Britannian slogan, this is our house on it. Um, that started as a neighborhood initiative and has become an international artist uh, residency center. Really what um, these engages can be when they are well done on an ICR level is they are global. They are local and global, not next to each other, but rolled into one. I use here an example, um, the European Union Film Festival here in Toronto, um, which was founded uh, at the Goethe Institute in Toronto uh, 16, 17 years ago now. Um, I happen to be on the board and have the privilege of co-steering and co-programming it. And the beauty is that I chose this particular image. This is the Royal Theatre, where uh, unless uh, we can't because of COVID, we do screen and we did screen uh, again this year. Um, this is the Royal Cinema. It is in the heart of Little Italy. And that was important to us to choose this as a home base for this film festival that is rooted in the multi-European uh, um, communities here and all European Union uh, countries and representations are participating in this festival, uh, which is absolutely uh, amazing. And they do use their diaspora networks for outreach. Um, Sherry mentioned reciprocity and I was really glad to hear that, of course. Um, what I mean here is this has to be an exchange, a multi-log, a two-way street, um, so that we can reach intercultural understanding that is that is the core and the heart of my work. Um, just uh, one example here, uh, Andrea Alexis is one of uh, Canada's best and uh, best known authors. He um, spent a year in Berlin um, as an artist in residence of the German Academic Exchange Service. And I had an hours long Zoom with him and I said, so um, Andre, where where are you in the city? Where do you live? Where's this apartment? He said, you know what, You're, it's in Schöneberg and it's amazing. I'm walking around Schöneberg. Schöneberg is a West Berlin district that is very bohemian, artsy, it's very queer. Uh, Helmut Newton lived there, Marlene Dietrich, Gottfried Benn was born there. And I could tell that Andre really related uh, to this. So this is the end result a year later. He uh, did a, a four-part video essay for the Goethe Institute Toronto that you can see on our Instagram channel quoted here. Um, and the beauty is, I will point this out, the, the piece is called Schöneberg, a meditation, not Berlin, a meditation. It is about a neighborhood that somebody experienced on an exchange um, that he relates back to his home uh, here in Toronto, which is Parkdale, which is a neighborhood down the down the street from me, but so so a truly neighborhood to neighborhood uh, encounter. Uh, over the last few years, uh, we have worked out how to go uh, digital, and amazingly, neighborhood encounters can be digital and can work digitally. This is an example I commissioned earlier this year. Uh, from Sherry Kasman. Please do look her up on Instagram. She's a fantastic uh, Toronto-based activist and artist um, who works in my neighborhood. So I literally went for a walk and a coffee with her during COVID and I said, Carrie, Sherry, how can we translate this? How can we make this relevant for a platform uh, called 1000 Scores in Berlin that had asked me, uh, that had given me carte blanche to, to um, curate a few pieces that would work anywhere. You know, you can open this notation, this sheet in, you know, in Dhaka and Bangladesh. Um, and as it says in the in the corner there, go outside and do it. So it's a beautiful example of a virtual connection. This is another that I'm quite proud of. We just did at the Goethe where a policymaker from the Berlin Senate um, came together or we brought them together with a, sort of a total grassroots activist, again, a guy who sort of lives around the corner from me and who um, created the Bag of Toronto, which is really sort of a bi-local initiative to help uh, Main Street culture uh, and help small stores and design stores uh, survive. Um, the BIAs, the business associations here in Toronto, are some of the institutions that are really uh, vital and we'll get to talk about um, institutions 
that support neighborhood work because here is my my advocacy part now oops sorry going the wrong way um i'm ending with this a call to action around protection and care really as neighborhoods can be so very easily overlooked or neglected um but they are crucial um and uh, I will say this in every single presentation on international arts that I will uh, ever give, they need government support and funding. Without that, it does not work. Um, Heather Kelly also mentioned that certain things, of course, are done by volunteers and grassroots, but it has to be honored and supported. And that leads me to the end of uh, this first sort of impulse session. For me, I truly mean it, neighborhoods make the city. They make the city livable, but they really make the city and they shape civil society, which then gets us into very important transnational touch points again. Thank you so much. I will somehow try to stop the screen share. Here we go. And Valeria will get me back. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much uh, to our four panelists for this uh, uh, excellent overview of oh, a diverse range of uh, cultural diplomacy, cultural uh, relations activities uh, at the neighborhood level in actions uh, in our cities. And um, I, when I was listening to all these you know, different examples, uh, different practices, uh, my question is actually to, this, uh, to the whole panel, uh, what unifies all of this? Or oh, they are all, I mean, they certainly, they, are, you know, uh, they have their own characteristics and anything that unifies us, we try to talk about this at you know, cultural diplomacy at a local neighborhood or, or city diplomacy or diplomacy at some uh, national level. Uh, I just wanted to hear uh, from the panelists uh, if you have any thoughts about uh, what, might be mm -hmm. the uh, what, what might be the unifying um, thread uh, among all the different uh, ways and uh, diverse approaches uh, to uh, cultural relations at the local level. Anybody? Sherry? Are you um, well, I, you know, that's interesting. I always say that the local is a microcosm of the larger world out there. So, so much of what is important and is relevant uh, that touches people's lives happens at the local level and through these kind of spaces. And so, yes, we have all of these threads that, that you were referring to, what it, what brings them together? You know, I, I, one thing that came out as I was listening to everybody is, you know, we are essentially talking about quality of life here. We're talking about what, the, because having these healthy, happy residents in our neighborhoods, it, it's, it's about increasing quality of life for, for uh, our communities. And so for me, the kind of the equalizer there, uh, uh, regardless of who, the, uh, who is uh, carrying out the action, the activity, who is, who is involved and engaged, we really want people to feel that they belong to the community, to the larger community, while at the same time maintaining their authenticity and their unique aspects, which they bring to the community with which which they enrich us. So we want everyone to know that they are welcome, that they're respected, uh, and that we, we, we welcome that diversity. But at the same time, we want everyone to feel they are part of that larger community. And consequently, again, I think it really does lead to that quality of life question. Thank you. I was really sure. happy to, <laughs> sorry, we sometimes have a little little bit of a time lag. Um, I was really, really happy to realize we are from quite different cities. Uh, I know LA just a bit. I've never been to San Antonio, but now I really want to see the, the Zona Cultura, by the way. Um, but, you know, we're talking about also two very different approaches in the US and Canada to multiculturalism or whatever you want to call it, or the mosaic and, and the melting pot. And what I've found amazing is that we were all talking about really the power uh, of diversity and that all of us, I think, um, have talked about outreach beyond sort of ethnic uh, um, enclaves or borders while, while using that power. So that I found uh, fantastically inspiring. I'll pick up on what Yuta just said too, because I was feeling exactly the same way. It was so fascinating to hear us each talk about um, 
living and working in a context of cult cultural pluralism and pluralistic societies and, and cities and neighborhoods. Um, and even when there is, you know, potentially one sort of culture or community focus, each of us was speaking about forming relationships and sharing and um, fostering connection and understanding between humans of differing cultures and communities. Um, and whether it was, you know, Edmund, Edward, when you said, you know, people didn't know or care about, <laughs> about Koreatown, at the, uh, you know, um, but that changed. Right. And uh, and and similar, Sherry, when you're speaking, you know, about the various cultural festivals, I was really resonating with that because Toronto has so many cultural festivals that are very culture or ethno cultural um, specific. And really, they are both gatherings of the community. Um, but I also know from working on many, many of them, the, the idea too is again to foster connection and communication and understanding and overcoming the sense of other and otherness um, by creating that. So anyway, I'll stop there for now. Yeah, to me, uh, I'm not quite familiar with a uh, case in Canada, Toronto, but in the United States, when you talk about a city such as LA, uh, we talk about multi-ethnic, multi-racial, and yet the paradigm we are always encounter is mostly black and white, uh, and yet the city composition is a very multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-racial, and so it's an Asian American experiences. I think it's very somehow used to be invisible. Now in caught in the middle. So, you know, we are struggling with how do we center Asian American experiences and perspective in and try to reframe black and white par paradigm into multi-ethnic, multi-racial paradigm. That's been a major struggle and ongoing struggle, even in, in we are going to commemorate 30th anniversary of LA civil unrest next year. And yet all the mainstream East Coast bias uh, is pretty much black and white still. So, you know, how do you make it more visible in in case of a San Antonio, mostly Latino, and we, we are still putting this black and white paradigm. So I think the, that needs to be really put in proper context, you know, paradigm. I want to follow up on, uh, you know, uh, the, this uh, conversation, I was asking about what unifies everything, but also any kind of a cultural encounter uh, can be harmonious. I think all the examples you're giving are harmonious. Uh, certainly they can also be um, uh, conflictual, you know, uh, tensions. So I wanted to hear uh, just in your experience, what are the tension points uh, as we practice cultural diplomacy at the local level? I mean, in LA, you know, I mentioned already what happened in 1992, the tension between Korean immigrants and African American community uh, erupted. And, and yet, uh, you know, majority of a resident of LA is a Latino. So there are many tensions between Blacks and Latino, Asians and La Latino, Asians and African Americans, and the white community there. So in the aftermath of LA civil unrest of 1992, what I described was like a balkanization. You know, we were all you know, trying to uh, look for our own interests, you know, disregarding someone else's. So we were in a very divided city uh, in 1992. Uh, now we have come a long way in 30 years. So we are trying to improve, trying to understand each other, engage in uh, networking and move constructive uh, e uh, political, economic, educational activities, coalition buildings. So therefore, I think there are some differences between immigrant generation and second generation where they are much more aware of the importance of coalition building, reaching out to other communities and try to engage more constructive dialogue and political activism. 
Oh, oh. Go question. ahead. Uh, I'll just mention comes to mind and try and form my thoughts as I'm speaking. But you know, when you speak about the tensions in doing cultural diplomacy and and challenges, one of the things that's come to mind for me is you know, and thinking about those cultural events, they're usually of one country or culture. Um, but in Toronto, I've been involved with many events where, in particular double bill concerts, I'll say, where there are two different countries or cultures on the same show or part of the same show. And in the world context, those countries or cultures are in conflict. Um, and in Toronto, they are brought together for an event and it's a challenge it's 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 a challenge and an opportunity and it at least in the ones i've been involved in it's always actually turned out to be a really beautiful thing um but i've certainly worked on events where we've had you know turkish and kurdish communities on the same event uh trinidadian and jamaican um arab and Pal and well arab and jewish or palestinian and israeli and many many different others you know um examples those just come to mind off the top of my head of ones that uh singular events where we're using the culture and arts to bring people together in a safe space and to again foster connection um and uh something more meaningful let's say but you know, Jay, you ask about a challenge and, and you know, challenging situations. You know, people need to be reassured that they're safe spaces. People need to be reassured that this is, you know, um, done with good intention um, and things like that. And so, yeah, anyway, that's just what came to mind when you, when you asked. Thank and you, maybe sure, from you wanna... Toronto. Oh, oh sorry. sorry. Go maybe, ahead, maybe just one sentence to finish off uh, at Toronto. Um, on a different strata, so it's super interesting. I would I, I subscribe to everything that Edward was just saying about that sort of horizontal uh, transnational within neighborhoods and within one city, but also you know what happens globally in cities uh, uh, impacts uh, neighborhoods, and I think that would be an um, that's an amazing opportunity for cross conversations. For example, and I tried to point out a few in my presentation: gentrification. I'm just back from Berlin. I, uh, uh, my family has lived in Berlin for hundreds of years. This is the biggest crisis this city has seen since it was put to rubble in 1945. It is shocking, the, the space and gentrification crisis, or, in, and, and we see it in Toronto too, uh, traffic and transit is another one. Um, Main Street culture that I mentioned is another one, post-COVID recovery. All of these things I think we can learn from you know, best practices in parts of LA and Frankfurt and, uh, you know, Singapore and, and Edinburgh. Yeah. I was going to, I was going to say something earlier and now I'm going to say something else, but let me go back to my earlier comment. You know, the uh, Mexican American civil rights movement, one of the places where really uh, we see a lot of history is in San Antonio uh, in the early and mid uh, 20th century, so much so that a lot of that history kind of wasn't really well known and and it was revindicated recently. There was uh, funding set aside from city council to help uh, the create for the creation of a Mexican American Civil Rights Institute at one of our local universities. And of course they are moving along and growing, but it's about documenting and preserving the kind of history of what it ha what what actually happened and what Mexican American communities experienced. Of course, they experienced in those years. There was a lot of racism. Uh, there was also a lot of exclusion. And and you know you I would, even today I meet people of a certain generation where they'll tell me that they couldn't speak Spanish uh, in the schools. They would be reprimanded for speaking Spanish in their schools. A lot of people don't believe this, but that was the the case here in South Texas. And so. Uh, 
that has obviously changed now. Now there's bilingual education in many schools, uh, Spanish being taught across, and there is this revindication of uh, our of that Mexican American uh, Mexican culture before. And interestingly enough, your question was about you know conflicts, and 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 I immediately thought you know we are home to the Alamo. The Alamo is a symbol of the independence of Texas, and and has for many for uh, since 1836 being kind of kept as that symbol and shrine for the state of Texas. But there's been a lot of controversy in recent years around how the story is told, and uh, and so uh, there the, you know there are different groups uh, uh, who represent different obviously narratives, and you know they're uh, very legitimately of course there are groups who say you know there were indigenous communities here on these grounds. It was a mission. It was a Spanish mission uh, way before 1836. And so there's a lot of that history. And again, it comes, it, it, what surfaces is whose story are we telling when we're telling these historical stories? Uh, uh, and, and, and it's going to be interesting to, again, see the evolution of that project and improvements they're making uh, in front of the Alamo and Alamo Plaza, uh, because that is something that, for instance, is right now uh, in conversation. Thank you. Thank you also very much for your reflections. And uh, I'm going to start also uh, bringing some questions from the audience, and it's very re relevant to some of the things that we're discussing. Um, so here's a question from um, an audience member. Um, a question specific for uh, Professor Chan, uh, but you know, welcome everyone else's input as well. Uh, the question is, is the concentration of communities in certain urban areas as opposed to spreading, which European cities more often aim for, internally empowering, making it in fact easier to bring about cultural exchange? Well, I, if you look at the history of evolution of traditional ethnic enclave, such as Chinatown, Koreatown, or Little Manila, Little Tokyo in the United States, is a direct outcome of involuntary segregation. It was not a voluntary segregation. It was because of a racism that drove those ethnic minorities into particular neighborhood and started setting aside a white only area, residential area. So that's the history of evolution of tradition, traditional ethnic enclave. Whereas uh, the, those ethnic enclaves they evolved in the 70s and 80s uh, is more of a uh, voluntary uh, to help a uh, safe uh, refuge for the immigrants. So it, it, it has a, a both a voluntary as well as involuntary aspects of it. Uh, but now, uh, it, if you look at the Koreatown as an example in Los Angeles, it truly has become transnational enclave. All kinds of different people come to Koreatown, LA. And recently, you know, BTS <laughs> performed in the uh, in SoFi Center and more than 200,000 people uh, of all kinds of different backgrounds came to LA. They used the term invasion of Koreatown. They all came to Koreatown and just really making Koreatown very uh, thriving, dynamic place to intermingle and engage in this kind of a cultural diplomacy, right? So that, that's an example. So it has both aspects of it, I think. Thank you. Uh, any other thoughts on this? Um, so the other uh, 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 question, when we often um, discuss uh, in uh, culture diplomacy, uh, is the question of, aside from advancing mutual understanding, how does cultural diplomacy also may advance international policy, whether it's economic policy, uh, cultural policy, you know, uh, political foreign policy? And uh, we also have a couple of questions from the audience kind of related to that theme. Uh, for instance, uh, one question asks, uh, can you use cultural diplomacy to help relieve uh, the current border tensions? And uh, another question um, asks, uh, what are your thoughts on how the rise in climate migration may impact cultural diplomacy work in global cities uh, in a ways that uh, how climate migration uh, uh, not only impacting cultural diplomacy, but also 
how diplomacy, uh, cultural diplomacy at the local level uh, may have an impact on the, the ways how we shape policies uh, towards uh, uh, climate and also climate migration uh, implications. Uh, any thoughts on that? In what ways uh, cultural diplomacy not only advances mutual understanding, but also uh, in instances, uh, some instances that may also advance international policy? Anyone? San Antonio, <laughs> Sherry, I want to ask you about since the question talking about water, uh, you know, uh, uh, policies and all of that. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, I, I, it was uh, it was actually a, a the, it's it was multiple questions in the one question, yes, and I was trying to right. get my head around the <laughs> the the questions. You know, I was I, I keep coming back to uh, obviously we talk about the mass migration around the world, some of it through climate change, some of it through violence in other parts of the world. And and so, again, it's the local communities that are receiving the uh, uh, asylum seekers, refugees, new immigrants, and and we are having to uh, to integrate them, welcome them. And it's, it's, it's uh, what are the policies that cities have around, you know, making sure that we are welcoming cities for our new Americans in our case and uh, and so of course I think that it that is uh, it, something that has has also shifted uh, for instance how in our case for instance there has been more prioritization given into for instance having a a position of an immigration liaison that didn't exist before and about three years ago four years ago they funded an immigration liaison and Prior to that, and, and I know every city is different, and I think in Canada, potentially it may, may be very, very different at the local government level, but we didn't have in our local government anybody who was kind of dealing with and was a liaison on immigration issues. And so uh, there has been those kind of slight nuances and changes that have impacted the local uh, perspective. Uh, but um, I, I, I welcome the thoughts of my colleagues on this panel. You know, immigrant communities maintain very close relations with their homeland. So homeland politics is directly involved in, in the immigrant community in the United States. And so Korean American communities are no different. Uh, therefore, one of the uh, important elements or key issues facing Korean American community here in Southern California is reunification. You know, North Korea nuclear crisis. Uh, what do you do? You know, how do you engage in peaceful the reunification of Korean Peninsula? So certainly, we don't want another war, right? It, it will have a devastating impact, particularly women and children, and possibly in env environment. You know, nuclear crisis. So, you know, we need to prevent at any cost, right? But so that's one of the examples of how Korean American community is involved in the international relations in, in and American foreign policy, for example. Uh, how do you deal with North Korea? And that's a very important issue for many immigrant community here in Southern California. Thank you. Um, I want to go on to another question, actually, from, also from the audience. I was going to ask you a similar question, which is, um, so here's the audience question. Thinking about neighborhoods as players of, for cultural diplomacy, how are the relationships between the local governments and the citizens mediated? Is there a point where the interests of the government might interfere with the original goal organizations were seeking? That's very interesting. I, I think that the local governments all over are trying uh, all the best, everything they can to make sure that they are hearing the local residents, creating programs to have residents provide input so that that input can inform the decisions that uh, then uh, create the policies, uh, the diverse policies. Uh, one of the biggest ways at the local level where the input is received are obviously through citizen engagement committees, forums, town halls, and uh, a, a, an important time of the year, for instance, when we do get that, a lot of input and engagement is during budget time. when 
when the mayor and council are are uh, with city staff, uh, they are looking at the city budget, setting the budget for the next year, the priorities, how money should be spent, and that is, uh, you know, a, a lot of work is done to try and create that engagement. Uh, usually, obviously, through the specific instruments. Uh, but I feel that uh, I, I was to speak for our experience here in San Antonio, uh, that has been really prioritized, kind of that public, that engaging our residents and making sure that they know that their voices are heard and it, they are part of the process, that, the, that process which influences these important decisions. One of the I love key... Well, one of the key issues that facing Koreatown over the last 30 years has been representation. Who represents Koreatown? Until a few days ago, Koreatown was divided into four different city councils in classic gerrymandering, right? Uh, because Koreatown was viewed as ATM, you know, a fundraising machine. So each different city council wanted to piece of the pie. And for the first time, uh, a few days ago, city council passed a resolution unifying Korea Town into one city council district. So for the first time, they are going to be represented by one city council men rather than divided by four different council districts. I think that's one of the prime example of how Korean American community became very engaged in political representation. 30 years ago, we were invisible. We were, had no voice, uh, no representation. But now uh, they have been actively involved in neighborhood council and trying to gain access and representation. And finally, the Korea town in, is now one city council district. And if I may just jump in, Edward, what you just said, uh, I think was really, really interesting and kind of highlights uh, the importance for uh, the voice of, of, of our minorities. And I, I know that, as I said earlier, we have a growing, very quickly, fast growing Asian community in our city. And about six years ago, one of our former councilwomen who, was, who, who is Asian, uh, she created an association, uh, which its role, it's the Alamo Asian Alliance of San Antonio, bringing together is like an umbrella organization for all the diverse Asian organizations and associations in our city to have to play a role of advocacy with local government and to, to be, make sure that the issues that were important to the different Asian communities could be heard under this one umbrella. And so definitely uh, kind of organizing and making sure that not they're not disparate voices, but these unified voices, I think has been very effective. I was about to uh, to react to what um, Sherry was saying before and, and just say again, I really have to come to San Antonio apparently uh, because I really appreciate uh, everything you're laying out. I always uh, think about in neighborhoods and, and especially city governments as, as like stalactites and stalagmites who kind of, you know, come kind of move towards each other in that, that cave that is the city to stay in that metaphor. It can be glacial also in, in terms of how it moves. Um, a positive and a more critical example, uh, Toronto, uh, as you saw in my, my second slide, is, is and Canada is happy to have three levels of government funding for the arts in particular. We have the Toronto Arts Council and the Toronto Arts Foundation. And at the Toronto Arts Foundation is that sort of neighborhood uh, arts network. Um, and that's where the, the city monies go for support in that. So, that is great. I do see, and that is more in my private life, and again, my engagement in my own neighborhood of Bloordale, um, massive disruptions. So, um, and I'm sure we've all seen it. There is tokenism, there's performativity uh, in community consultations where they are being held, but do they mean anything? There is a certain level of faux democracy, and I do see it in Toronto, I see it in Berlin, I see it in um, in, in Kolkata and other uh, cities that I do spend considerably time in. Um, so these are global, again, that's a global challenge and global questions and maybe also neighborhood um, frank 
neighborhood uh, exchanges can help in mitigating um, these, these structural challenges, uh, especially here when it comes to anything from homelessness to uh, development, um, to again, the space crisis. Um, just this week, 60 arts organizations have been uh, evicted from the um, uh, historic distillery district in Toronto, which uh, of course the old story, they, these arts organizations shaped this district to become a destination for businesses, small businesses and restaurants and uh, then condo towers and now the arts organizations have to go. That is 60 arts organizations in a city of 3 million is, is, a, is a huge tragedy. Mm -hmm. So we have, yeah, there's, there's lots to do still in neighborhood and, and municipal relations, I think. Sorry, Jay. I saw you wanted to move on. No, I was no. I was going to ask you actually because when oh. I we were talking back to the a question about the you know, relationship with the local uh, city government and uh, sure, when yeah. you uh, yeah. made the remarks about you didn't receive any funding <laughs> when you uh, when the project was taken out, I was just wondering, you know, how did you uh, go about doing this and what's the relationship uh, between the corridor and the uh, and the and the city of Toronto? Sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I'll reference your earlier version of the question in that too, is because I think your earlier version was asking if the city sort of impedes or slows things, you know, stops things or harms, or, but, but not at all. I mean, the city of Toronto has always been very encouraging, positive um, moral support, let's say, for the Bloor Street Culture Corridor, always been very, very uh, positive. And the city of Toronto also has a lot of really great initiatives. Um, I think we just need to recognize that the city also has its own priorities. It has its own priorities strategy-wise and uh, location and geography, you know, around the city as well. So, um, so that kind of comes into play. There's no actual like structure or program or um, anything that the Bloor Street Culture Corridor fits into. So, it also happens that to answer the second version of your question more directly, the Blur Street Culture Quarter was formed by the existing culture organizations. And it existed for two or three years before we went to the city and asked for official designation as a cultural corridor and were able to work with the city's um, administration offices for that to happen. And it was a very positive thing, um, but it comes with no funding. So yeah, the Blur Street Culture Corridor has no funding other than the individual cultural organizations that may be funded, as you just said, say through the Toronto Arts Council or um, some other uh, levels of government or, or, or other, other funding systems. The corridor as a partnership, as an entity unto itself, is not funded at all. Um, just in November, the City of Toronto voted to develop a cultural districts program. So there has been no cultural districts program at all until now. There have been designations, um, but, uh, but yeah, so it's less than a month ago that uh, that was voted in. I see that as a very positive thing um, and we'll see how that evolves. But of course, the, the Blur Street Culture Quarter will be happy to support and be part of and, you know, communicate with them about that and, and do what we can to be involved. Thanks, Heather. Um, moving on to a slightly different uh, topic. Um, uh, this actually comes from a question uh, by an audience member. Uh, have you developed a virtual component to your work given the current COVID uh, situation? And have you developed new ways to connect across borders? And uh, however you wanted to define uh, uh, what borders mean, or you may want to redefine uh, what borders <laughs> actually mean uh, in light of uh, a virtual uh, experience. Anyone yeah, I'd, your, I'd be yes. happy to jump. I'd be happy to jump about that because I, I think you know, with COVID, I think we were all paralyzed initially. Uh, you know, didn't really, really didn't know what this meant, how long it was going to go on for, and then suddenly had to came to the realization that this was not a short-term situation, and 
uh, in my line of work, it, it obviously had a severe impact. Uh, we were no longer receiving groups of people coming in and we were not able to go out into the world. And we had to pivot and our pivot was through virtual engagement. Uh, and, and of course, when we're talking about virtual engagement, you know, there was uh, mm. engagement about best practices, but I always have found that, you know, those virtual cultural exchanges are really the ones that have perhaps left the most impact, have been really interesting and, uh, and, and a, a, a lot of room for creativity. I'll give you one one example of something that we did kind of at the on the earlier side uh, uh, last year in this was in the month of um, April May time and the US Embassy in Korea approached us uh, about uh, it, the baseball season was starting in in Korea and uh, and Guangzhou is our sister city uh, 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 and home of the democracy movement in 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 South Korea uh, and uh, and so they had uh, our mayor had originally you know been planning to go he was going to uh, attend an important commemoration of the 1981 movement um, and a, a wasn't able to. And so the embassy proposed that the two mayors participate in a virtual pitch, baseball pitch, uh, with the Korean Tigers as a professional baseball team and in their kind of opening game. And so we, so this was all worked. We all worked on our, each side to have the mayors do their virtual pitch. And, and what came together was this very short video that obviously was played uh, at the game, uh, at the virtual, uh, because in Korea they were playing to empty stadiums initially. And uh, it was incredible. It was an incredible example of what you could do using the technology to, pr to uh, promote goodwill and to actually reach a far greater audience than you did in the past. And and so ver definitely that was an example of all the many things we would be able to do, and we have we have used virtual engagement in a lot of the the work we do. And again, I keep coming back to sometimes we don't realize that through these uh, through the technology and the virtual uh, aspect, we are actually having a an impact on a larger group of people because everyone can connect to a computer from home. Yeah, the yeah, current exhibition here downtown Riverside on Pachapa Camp, uh, we are doing both uh, in-person as well as online virtual uh, tour. And we are also planning a uh, traveling exhibition. Uh, we are in conversation with New York-based organization, possibly bringing in exhibition to New York and DC, maybe Toronto if you are interested in that. Uh, but different places, but uh, also, you know, online virtual tour is uh, possible. And because of a PBS News Hour and NPR coverage of the exhibition, we are getting lots of feedback. So, so we are doing both uh, virtual and in person. Yeah, I mean, as a programmer, sorry, <laughs> Heather, no, you, you go, go first. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, okay. From a practical programming perspective, yeah, we're, we're, we will be forever, of course, in a hybrid world. I had uh, a long used uh, digital formats. Um, another uh, specific format that works really well is, um, you know, anything sort of augmented reality, right? Because you can literally take, you move realities and, and virtualize them or whatever you want to call it, AR, VR, XR, extended and also culturally then extended, which is fantastic. Um, and I also, uh, uh, it just occurred to me as we we're talking about sort of virtual opportunities in cities, it is probably not a coincidence that the um, that little meeting platform that many of us have found ourselves in over two years is called Gather Town. And it has both of those elements, right? The, the town, the city, square, and gather the meeting place. So yes, it can be virtual, Personally, also, I'm looking forward uh, uh, to coming back into, uh, uh, you know, real visitors programs and uh, uh, real opportunities uh, to meet people again in cinemas and theaters. But of course, again, hybridity is the way to go and reach is, is massively increased, exchange is increased. Uh, Sherry is absolutely right. Yeah, just echoing that uh, pretty much every cultural organization on the Bloor Street Culture Corridor and, and many around the city did turn to presenting and engaging 
community and audiences online when we couldn't invite people into our spaces. Um, so it was a really a vital way of staying visible, staying connected, engaging people, continuing whether it's you know Zoom events that were actual dialogue or whether it was live stream concerts or tours of exhibitions or whatever it happened to be, you know, so, so much of it moved online. And I think organizations were really seeing it as an opportunity for um, not just staying in touch and staying engaged, but also for audience development and for increasing global presence because, you know, in most cases being online, unless it's geofenced and things like that, you, you know, there is international potential uh, for audiences. So um, I think the debate is, uh, is still happening of whether or not it will lead to real tangible economic impact uh, from cultural tourism um, of creating those connections, but it's worth continuing to discuss and worth trying, I think. Um, the other factor that it really led to and was, I think, an element was also accessibility. Um, and people who would not normally be able to engage with physical spaces yeah. were able to engage with online culture. Now, whether that's, you know, uh, arts based or whether it's your cultural community center or other forms, um, I think that was really, really important, both in terms of increasing accessibility in general, but then also um, keeping people involved in community. Um, so I think too, you know, when we first started in COVID, as first everything went online, um, you know, people were really happy to engage online rather than not at all, because that was the option, right? Um, and now I think that as as you just said, you know, we're in this hybrid world, it will continue. It now has options that we're offering people. Um, but what we're starting to see here at least is, you know, there, there continues to be a hesitancy with some people about coming into public spaces, particularly in closed, um, close proximity type public spaces, cultural spaces. Um, and yet there's other people who were just like so glad to be able to come together again. Um, so I think we will see both the hybrids. I think we're still at a very specific stage in time in coming out of and through COVID. Um, but we are also seeing a preference for coming back together in person overall, just Zoom fatigue, you know. <laughs> here, 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 here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, we are coming to the end of our program, and but I do wanted to ask this question, and I just need your very brief answer. So, as a practitioner, especially, do you see yourself as a diplomat? Absolutely. Yeah. I, okay. I, I, yeah. <laughs> it's. Not I would say you said, you said short answer, short question, short answer. So. Yeah, yeah. diplomacy yeah. is personal. <laughs> Uh, yeah, definitely. My, my short Clear. answer is not so much. I do not uh, prefer that terminology. I see myself as an engaged citizen. Oh, good. That sounds great, Utah. I wish I would have thought of that. I, I also do not see myself as a as a as a diplomat. I see myself more as a communicator, a connector, and potentially an ambassador. But, yes. I think diplomacy is also personal. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be. Yeah, you know, owned by the politicians or diplomats only. So it can be personal. And and we are all ambassadors, uh, and and we have to empower our residents to be ambassadors of our communities and you know again our cities and and so it, it it's a it's an interesting question. I didn't expect the the answers I got from Utah and Heather, but you're absolutely right because I also feel like I'm an engaged citizen and and uh, very much a part of. Uh, this kind of the fabric of our community. Well, on that note, diplomacy is personal. Uh, we come to the end uh, of our uh, panel discussion. Uh, this concludes our session and also the summit, uh, the third and the final summit uh, of the North American Culture Diplomacy Initiative. And, I'm sorry, the third and the final summit of the North American Diplomacy Initiative will be organized next year uh, by the University uh, Ibero-Americana. And I wanted to thank our panelists for this very informative, uh, enriching conversation and to the uh, initiative and to Korean Foundation uh, for their support. And most of all, to all of you who tuned in to our program today. 
And this is also our last uh, public program of the year. So please check out our uh, latest annual report and stay uh, in touch and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and online. Uh, we have an exciting lineup of programs coming up in the new year, uh, topics ranging from artificial intelligence and public diplomacy, climate diplomacy, the domestic dimension of public diplomacy as we continue uh, the theme of our public diplomacy uh, in the subnational uh, level, uh, to the World Expo in Dubai, uh, sports diplomacy and public diplomacy in emerging economy societies. And so we hope that you'll stay tuned and happy holidays and see you all next year. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Pleasure. Mm -hmm.